key to seeing improvement and making progress is making sure that your strategy or treatment matches your diagnosis and underlying mechanism. And one of the most important aspects for you in understanding your hypothyroidism is determining whether or not you have Hashimoto's. That's why in today's video, we are going to clearly define Hashimoto's. That way you can determine whether it's a problem for your hypothyroidism. We'll also go over areas that people are commonly confused by. And finally, discuss some less common lab presentations. To both those who are new and returning, my name is Dr. Brad Bodel, and I specialize in helping people use natural strategies to improve their Hashimoto's and hypothyroid symptoms. And if you like today's content and have been enjoying some of the other information, please remember to subscribe to the channel and also give this video a thumbs up. I post videos on Thursday mornings and you don't want to miss when any new content becomes available. But to get started today, just like with any other symptom that we might be experiencing, we have to make sure that our treatment matches the mechanism. And what I mean by that is, let's say we're experiencing something like fatigue. Well, fatigue can be caused by a lot of different things. And if we treat everyone with fatigue as exactly the same, then there's gonna be a lot of people who don't get better when we apply whatever treatment we select. Thyroid conditions are no different, and that's why understanding whether or not you have Hashimoto's is such a big deal. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Hashimoto's is an autoimmune condition where we have antibody-mediated destruction of our thyroid cells. And it is the most common cause of hypothyroidism in developed countries. Classically, Hashimoto's is diagnosed and defined as someone having low thyroid symptoms, anything that represents a decrease in metabolism, such as fatigue, weight gain, hair loss, joint pain, constipation, dry skin, thinning nails, and neurological changes, in combination with the presence of thyroid antibodies on your blood panel and diffuse changes on ultrasound. These days, it's not always necessary to get the ultrasound and most often the diagnosis is made off of symptom presentation and the presence of antibodies alone. Since Hashimoto's is an autoimmune condition where our immune system is attacking our own tissue, these antibodies are the key and they're also the cause of a lot of confusion. When we're talking about antibodies, we are specifically referring to TPO antibodies, also known as thyroid peroxidase, and TG antibodies, also known as thyroglobulin. These aren't the only proteins in your thyroid that your immune system can make antibodies for, but they are the most common, and therefore, they're the only ones that have clinical testing widely available. TPO antibodies are positive in about 90% of Hashimoto's cases, and TG antibodies are positive in about 60 to 80%. Of course, even though 90% is high, it's not 100%, and the mere presence of antibodies doesn't automatically define Hashimoto's. Research shows us that about 10 to 11% of healthy control subjects have positive thyroid antibodies. Additionally, it's not uncommon for many people to have detectable levels of antibodies, but antibodies that are still within the normal range. Some practitioners have said before that any amount of antibodies are unhealthy and we shouldn't be seeing them on our labs. However, it's completely normal to have a low amount of antibodies and have our immune system involved in cleanup of our cells. So if having some antibodies are normal and having lab high antibodies exist in healthy controls, how do we clearly define whether you have Hashimoto's? What I look for is positive antibodies based on the reference range of the lab that ran your test, plus the presence of overt thyroid symptoms. Now the reason it's so important to compare it to your lab's reference range is because different labs are going to have different techniques and different levels of sensitivity. A common range for TPO antibodies to be positive is anything above 34. But another standard range that a subset of labs will use is any TPO antibodies above nine. However, if your TPO antibodies are 15 and your lab range defines a positive result as above 34, then you wouldn't want to assume that you have Hashimoto's just because other labs use the range of above nine. The techniques are different here and it's a little bit of comparing apples to oranges. Now there are a few caveats here for why your antibodies could be negative but you still have Hashimoto's, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But again, for someone to be diagnosed with Hashimoto's, what we're looking for is positive TPO antibodies, 
and or positive TG antibodies, both of these above the reference range provided, and clinically relevant thyroid symptoms. Now when we put it in that context, it seems relatively straightforward and simple, but here's where people get goofed up. For most practitioners, when they refer to Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, they really don't care about the Hashimoto's part or the presence of antibodies. They only care about the hypothyroidism part. Hypothyroidism refers to the fact that our thyroid has been damaged and therefore it can no longer produce adequate levels of thyroid hormone. Hypothyroidism is defined by an increase in TSH and a decrease in total or free T4 values and is typically treated with a prescription for a synthetic version of T4 hormone that helps to replace or support your levels. The thing is, hypothyroidism isn't specific to the thing that is causing the hypothyroidism. It only tells us that thyroid hormone production is low. But because the standard treatment is thyroid hormone replacement, most doctors don't care what is going on around our thyroid until enough damage has occurred that that diagnostic criteria can be met, which then allows them to implement that specific strategy. But here's the thing, hypothyroidism is more of an end stage result of Hashimoto's and not where the disease begins. And the research is very clear that earlier on in the course of the disease, positive antibodies can present with thyroid symptoms and a decreased quality of life, even though the labs don't show hypothyroidism yet and may actually present as normal or hyperthyroid in nature. This fluctuation between hypo and hyperthyroid-like symptoms occurs because in early bouts of immune flare-ups, damage to our thyroid cells can spill excess thyroid hormone into the bloodstream, leading to intermittent increases in metabolism. Eventually, when enough destruction occurs, that's when the patient will exhibit more consistent hypothyroid presentation. But no matter whether you have low thyroid symptoms in the beginning or more of this fluctuating presentation, this is the key. Hashimoto's and autoimmunity is a progression and it takes place over months or years before we see changes in those standard TSH and T4 lab values. If we ignore the autoimmune aspect of Hashimoto's and don't fully comprehend the progression aspect, then it can lead to years of suffering and confusion by the patient. Plus, it allows further damage to occur to our thyroid when we could be taking action. So to reiterate one last time, hypothyroidism is defined by a decrease in T4 production and can be caused by chronic autoimmune activity from Hashimoto's. However, just because you don't have hypothyroidism yet, doesn't mean you're not having symptoms now. Which takes us to our last section of less common Hashimoto's presentations, which all essentially boil down to, I don't have the standard markers or symptoms for Hashimoto's, so do I actually have it? And how proactive do I need to be? And our first scenario is people with positive TPO antibodies, but normal TSH, normal T4, and no symptoms. As we just discussed, TPO antibodies can be predictive of future hypothyroidism, but they also exist in healthy people. Because symptoms are not present, we may not need to take action at this time. However, we should be proactive in tracking our lab values. If our TPO antibodies start to get up into the 300, 400, and 500 plus range, and or if our TSH starts to increase, then these are indicators that there could be disease progression. Only a small percent of women will go on to develop hypothyroidism with positive TPO antibodies being their only finding, but it is a clinically significant amount and we should always focus on you and the needs of the individual. Scenario number two is when we have TPO antibodies within the normal range, but it is nearing the threshold or cutoff point for those antibodies to be positive. Some research has shown that instead of using anything above 34 as a positive result, using a cutoff of 17 delivers the same amount of sensitivity and better accuracy when it comes to predicting Hashimoto's. So even though it isn't clinically definitive if you have TPO antibodies of 25, 
it is something that you want to start considering, especially if symptoms are present and if you have a family history of thyroid dysfunction. Scenario number three is someone who has negative TPO antibodies, but positive TG antibodies. Even though TG antibodies are less common with Hashimoto's, they are associated with thyroid autoimmunity. And in the context of low thyroid symptoms, positive TG antibodies by themselves can be indicative of Hashimoto's. The range here is normally zero to one, and anything above one can be considered a positive result. There are some research studies that have associated high levels of TG antibodies with thyroid cancer. So although we wanna be careful in any situation, if your TG antibodies start getting into the hundreds or thousands, then that's definitely a case where you'll wanna follow up with your doctor and get some additional testing. And finally, our last scenario is when someone has all the symptoms of thyroid dysfunction, but their TPO and TG antibodies are completely normal and they're nowhere near that cutoff point where the labs would indicate that they're positive. Now, we've spent all day talking about how Hashimoto's is defined by the presence of antibodies. So you would think, no antibodies? Well, can't be Hashimoto's then. However, once again, when we dig into the research, we find that there is a small subset of people, about 10 to 15%, depending on what you look at, that have what is referred to as seronegative Hashimoto's, meaning that the person has Hashimoto's, but there are no antibodies in their blood. Now, the exact reason why this happens still isn't well understood, but some of the theories include the individual may have a compromised ability to produce antibodies, their antibody levels could be depleted due to the chronicity of the condition, or maybe they are developing antibodies for a protein or enzyme in our thyroid gland that isn't being tested for. We mentioned earlier in the video that this is possible, but because it is so rare, it isn't something that is available in a clinical setting. So again, if you have all the thyroid symptoms and your history strongly indicates an autoimmune component, then you may wanna consider the possibility of seronegative Hashimoto's. In these cases with my patients, what we do is we construct a plan that would be autoimmune based or focused on that aspect of our health. And although this does require significant lifestyle and nutrition changes, it's not something that will hurt the patient, especially if we make these changes in the short term. However, if we're correct in our assessment, then we should start to see improvement and therefore we can use these functional changes to help us understand and justify the diagnosis. But no matter what aspect of Hashimoto's you fall under, remember that a lot of medical approaches today are based on checking boxes. It's about black or white, yes or no, on or off, and meeting diagnostic criteria. But that's not how autoimmunity operates. It exists in gray areas, and many of the markers are fluid. This is why we always have to take a holistic approach, assess every factor that could be contributing to your health, and use each piece to help understand the big picture. Accepting this approach will help you to better track the progression of your disease. That way you can be proactive, start improving your symptoms, and prevent damage down the line. If you like this video but have some questions, please leave me a comment down below. And if you learned something new but feel like you need some additional help and support and would like to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, then you can send me an email at contact at seattlethyroidhealth.com. From there, my staff will determine if you qualify for a free consultation in which you and I will be able to talk about your health history, where you're trying to go, and if we're a good fit to work together. I, of course, don't work with all people and just wanna make sure that you're in the right spot for you. If you're not ready to work one-on-one -on -one, but wanna make some changes at home, check out any of my free downloads in the description box below or watch some of my other videos. I always try to include a good mix of learning and understanding, plus practical and applicable strategies that you can start using at any time. But that's a wrap for today. Thank you so much guys for continuing to watch the videos and support the channel. The growth has really been amazing and I love having you guys as part of the community. Remember to like and subscribe if you haven't done so. And if you're looking for more regular tips and information, don't forget to follow me on Instagram or Facebook. My name is Dr. Brad Bodel. Thank you once again. I hope you guys have a great week and I'll see you in the next one.